Hi, welcome to In the Trenches, where we have the a wonderful opportunity to talk to design and product experience leaders about how they actually do the work of creating amazing products and experiences. And today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Daniela Jorge and uh, Jason Brightman, who are at PayPal currently as respectively the Chief uh, Design Officer and the VP of Global Design. And between them, they've had too many years of experience for me to, to mention, I think, out of politeness at companies like Amazon and Intuit and eBay and Yahoo. And so what a, a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Ron. It's great, great to, be to be here. Great. So we're going to dive right in and I'm going to go put you on the hot seat with some quick tips for people. So we're going to start with, I want to hear one tip you have for design leaders. And we'll go one from each of you. Okay. I'll go first. Go first. I think the, um, yeah, be curious. The uh, never stop sort of learning and asking questions and um, pushing on your assumptions. That's great. And mine is, I think, use the design skills that you've developed with stakeholders. I think it's similar to Jason's point about being curious, having empathy, trying to understand your audience, understand their needs uh, will really help you both in influencing, but also I think being be better partners. Oh, that's a great one. So, okay, when we think of, so now you're as a design leader, now thinking about the design org itself. What's one tip in how you think about a design org? Jason. So with that one, um, you know, I've been doing it long enough that there is no perfect org. At least I haven't found it yet. It's more about being really clear on what problems you're trying to solve and what you're trying to accomplish. And then experiment. Do the org and you know, a, a quarter later, three months later, sort of ask, did we hit these milestones that we thought we were going to hit? Did we accomplish what we wanted to without creating any sort of adverse um, impacts and you know, be willing to be wrong and try something new. But it's, it's about calling your shots and what you're trying to accomplish with the org style or the org um, arrangement. Yeah, that flexibility of, you know, there is no right. There's a great story about Facebook. A friend of mine said, if you don't like the org design, wait six months, it's gonna change. <laughs> That was going to be my point, which is that it's an ever evolving, you know, organism, if you will. Um, I, if I look at the organization I had three years ago, it seemed awesome. When I look back, it's like, wow, what were we doing? So, so just know that the company will evolve, you will evolve, and you need to keep evolving your, your organization too. Wonderful. And when you think about the individual design professional, almost the individual contributor, what tips would you give? The same, the same one that we talked about, um, you know, for design leaders, which I think is those aspects of curiosity and just trying to have a more holistic understanding of, of the business, the company, the users, the more that you seek to understand, the better of a designer you'll be. And also the more your work will actually have the opportunity to, to get built because you're factoring in all of those inputs. So I guess I would just add, um, have like continue to develop your craft and have strong opinions about it, but loosely hold them. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, have at that point of view, but um, not so rigid that you can't change your mind or be open to new ideas. We talk a lot about that internally, the sort of strong ideas, but loosely held. So I there's a theme of flexibility throughout all of these, right? Flexible in the org design, flexible in how you approach your teammates, flexible in how you approach your ideas that you, you know, we all tend to hold on to our sacred cow ideas, right? <laughs> Recognizing that you actually do need a slot of them sometimes. Um, and when you think about hiring, you know, especially what's amazing about PayPal is it, it's almost like it's accelerating in design at scale, which is so hard to do. And kudos to, to the two of you and your team. Um, when you think about hiring for the competencies to be able to be a great product experience professional at scale, what do you look for? So we, we um, in addition to obviously just craft and those you know table stake skills that you look for in a designer or researcher, we have five UX mindsets that we really value. Um, and I'll, I'll list them out and then I'll talk about the ones that, that I think really set a great designer apart. So they're customer centric, curiosity, outside in, continuous assessment and end-to-end. -end. Um, customer centric and continuous <laughs> assessment are so much part of obviously, right? How a designer works, how a researcher works. So what I've noticed is designers that are curious, that, that ask what if or why not, 
right in, in every context. Um, those who look for inspiration from other sources, so right, you can't just be myopic and looking at what we're doing, you're looking at competitors, you're looking at analogous experiences, you're looking at the customer's context. Um, and then lastly, the ones who think end to end, which I think in companies of our size is crucial, that you're really thinking about the, the end to end customer journey, not just maybe the two screens that, that you might be updating in yeah. a flow um, to me really set apart great designers from good designers. Yeah, I would really um, echo that. And then perhaps add empathy, which we talked about earlier. And that's part of that customer obsession, um, but uh, being empathetic to all of your partners and the, the business needs as well as the customer needs. Uh, I think is how you'll take somebody who maybe has great craft and you add the empathy to that and that's where you'll get great design um, rather than just really well executed design. So how do you test for empathy? It's a great, uh, I think it's a great skill for a lot of uh, roles inside, especially design, but also product and, and sometimes even business development and sales. And you know, how do you test for empathy? So I always look in the, the portfolio reviews and the conversations I'm having with the candidate for how do they talk about the customer? Mm -hmm. Do they paint a picture, not just of the, the stats of the customer, but like that customer's life and struggle and, and you know, what are the problems there that were, that they were trying to solve um, with whatever product they were working on. And um, you'd be surprised at how often designers don't mention any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the portfolio reviews. And so I think that to me shows they understand the, the customer and that they have empathy for it when they can really beautifully um, illustrate for us and, and put us in the, that customer's shoes while we're looking at their, their portfolio and their mocks or product experiences. Right. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to tools. So, you know, the one thing that's true is the tools change just as much as the org structure, it feels like. What tools are you using right now? Which ones do you think are highly effective and which ones have you actually stopped using? Um, our favorite tool right now is Figma. Mm -hmm. like Figma was a game changer for the organization. Uh, it allows designers to collaborate on the same files at the same time together and just being able to especially now we're all remote, mm -hmm. be on a conference call with everybody when we're in that same design file. And it's like in the old days when we could be at a whiteboard together, it's it magical. Um, it changed how we develop uh, and, and create things. We were using Sketch uh, beforehand and Sketch is a great, great tool. product as well. Um, but that collaboration piece of Figma is um, unmatched. It's amazing. I agree. And then Miro is another one that, you know, we use quite a bit on the collaboration front, especially like the sticky post-its re replacement uh, that comes with Miro. So that also, I think, and it's interesting to just see how it's become, I think, a go-to tool outside of just design or product. So, it, you know, we now use it enterprise-wide at, at PayPal. So many, many teams make use of it. So the, what I'm hearing is that collaboration as a key function within a tool has dynamically shifted which tools you adopt. So it might be that they're not the best in one area, but as long as collaboration is there, it's key. I noticed the same thing happened just 10 years ago with Google Docs versus Office, right? You know, Office was the, was the leader by far and still it does well, but wow, did it unlock the potential of teams when you could live inside the same document. And now it exists in many different functions, specifically design with Figma. And when should companies, when you think about earlier stage, start to adopt design systems? So it's, it's never too soon to start adopting a design system um, because as a, a company, a feature or a product scales, you're going to need it. I think it becomes essential when, um, the design team, you know, exceeds seven-ish people um, mm -hmm. uh, because you need something to help create the consistency of an experience when you get so many hands starting to work it. And when you start talking about the, the scale of something like PayPal, 
um, you couldn't operate without a design system. So I think uh, even if it's an individual designer who's starting out in, um, on a feature, I would say start thinking about how, the, how this would work as a system and scale, um, even if you're not, if it's not needed yet or you're not building those pieces yet, because you will need them and it's always easier to do things early than it is to redo things down the line. What I wanted to add was just an experience that I had when I was, you know, way back still a designer and we were a team of three in a very large company, but there were three of us, we sat in the same room and we were constantly looking over our shoulder and asking each other, hey, have you encountered, do you, have you done a scheduling UI, can you send over the little calendar pattern that you use, so that, you know, to me is also a signal of when you need a design system is when you start noticing that you're having these repeatable patterns that that would be more efficient to just have them in the design system versus relying on people like copying it and pasting and sending sending stuff over to each other or reinventing it which is obviously what the design system prevents one of our design principles is like a customer should only have to learn how to use paypal once mm. and it's that repeated patterns that daniela was talking about and that's why our design systems really can accelerate a team and make it easier for customers because you're reusing those patterns over and over. It makes the, the experiences much easier for a customer to kind of learn and use. And actually, so speaking of all of the assets that PayPal has, you know, um, there are some, sometimes as you scale, you're bringing in products that are via acquisition and you have these different teams. How do you think about organizing your teams and how has that changed over time to be able to either be sort of hub and spoke or embedded designers? We, we definitely are embed. We follow an embedded model, right? We're centralized, but we're embedded. I always use this terrible analogy, but that somehow I think people relate to, which is design is the team that the family that you're born into, and then you marry into your, and in a box is the term that we use internally, three in a box triad family. Um, so you're spending most of your time with your cross-functional team, but you're still having your Sunday dinners and your DNA all comes from, from your design family. And, and what we have found is at least, you know, in, in most cases, that model is really important. It's, it's hard, I think, to just, otherwise you end up with either a service model or design, you know, working in isolation in an island. So we have this embedded model across the board. Um, by and large, and, and that means that it makes it easier with the acquisitions because they're already coming in with that model. And then it's figuring out integration points, especially in cases where our products are also meant to integrate or to Jason's point where we may want to share, for instance, something between Vemo and PayPal, right? It's possible that one of the products already solved the problem. So let's make sure that we're resharing. That also then is something that we can bring to the table because we have that horizontal purview as, as a designer organization. Yeah, and it's something that um, in our model, like we don't even have to wait for sort of reorgs or do something systematically to start bringing the, the, the teams together that might come in through an acquisition. For example, um, we've had a lot of acquisitions uh, at PayPal and, and they have design systems and design system teams. So um, rather than do any kind of reorg or say everybody needs to be on this design system now, we just started um, uh, having those designers focused on design systems start meeting together um, and do, you know, it started as a monthly share out and then kind of grew from there because you have the same, you, you have people working on the same kind of problems and now at this large company, they can get more support and have more peers doing, doing the same thing and, and wrestling with the same issues. And so um, they just start naturally collaborating then, um, which then naturally starts bringing our systems closer together. And um, I think actually helps accelerate things. And so we can do it because it's still one design family, even though they're embedded in their various products. So any tips or tricks of keeping that DNA from the, the family of origin, if you will, together? We focus a lot so, on, on community and culture as well. So I think that there's different angles uh, of it. I'll, I'll talk to the community and culture and, and Jason, you can speak to, I think the design piece. Um, so we, we invest quite a bit in things like share out that are organization wide. Uh, we, we just had our annual summit last week. So that's another you know moment where 
all of, of design gets together for two days to get inspiration and training and, and just come together as a community. Um, and then other rituals, we have a channel that's probably the highest engaged channel at, at PayPal on Slack, where we do like questions of the day and other ways of, of just keeping everyone together and feeling connected that way. And then we also invest in things like training for the community. Um, obviously, career development and mobility is one of the, I think, biggest advantages of being centralized as an organization. So, so that's another area that we also really make sure that there's, you know, some meat behind it. Otherwise, we might as well not be centralized if we're not doing those things. We spend a lot of time like looking at how we support each other as a community. You know, designers um, are are slightly different than their your product partners and your engineering partners and um, you know having that community of other designers who are dealing with the same challenges you're dealing with um, that you can kind of go and get advice from or you know just be able to talk to somebody else who understands what you're going through and they're all in the same company and so you avoid some of the the complexities of trying to talk to the broader design community outside of your your company it's just wonderful to be able to get all of that support um, and i think that's what keeps the designers connected that actually does bring me to design reviews how do you organize design reviews who's involved up to what level and how does that keep consistency across the apps yeah so we have um sort of a series of design reviews i'll start on the team level and Daniela takes some more of the leadership level ones. So on the, the team level, the that three in the box team that Daniela was talking about um, is constantly reviewing the work and looking at it together at every stage. And then the design sort of managers are involved with that. Uh, and then the design directors who may be in charge of a, a series of products that we wanna keep together um, we'll look at it over that kind of series of products and make sure that there's kind of the consistency um, and that the team is, even though they're trying to solve their unique problem, is still looking at that end-to-end -end mindset that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and then the, the team can take it into what we have as an experience review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can Which, pick it up from there, Jason, if that, <laughs> I feel like you're yeah. throwing me the ball. So that was... Uh, something that we introduced last year, um, where we formed an experience council, which was me and at the time, one of the senior leaders in product. And the mandate was that basically anything that's customer facing needed to come through a review with the experience council. Um, and it's something that we have formalized even more now. So my product partner is now my manager, and that's one of his big focus area. So he, he now leads a, an ex, a organization called Customer Experience. Mm -hmm. And we spend sometimes two to three hours a day reviewing, uh, you know, work from, from different teams. It, and it spans the full range from products to customer support experiences, starting to look at internal tools and internal experiences as well. Um, but that has really helped, I think, a couple of, one is that we're, even though we know about all of these areas, we still have fresh eyes to the work. So we're coming in with that fresh perspective and at times noticing things or calling out things that the team may feel like are things that they don't have influence over. So for instance, perhaps there's a policy that's dictating the experience that a team may feel like obviously they don't own that policy, they, but, but we get to then ask those questions and connect with, with individuals who might be the owners of those decisions um, and see if those are things that we can and should revisit. How have you partnered with the sort of capital B brand um, in this organization or any other organization to create an effective whole customer experience? So brand at PayPal reports into marketing and, uh, and we work very, very closely with them in, in a number of ways. For instance, we, you know, our, our head of brand attends some of these experience reviews whenever there's brand efforts going on. Jason and I are both included. Um, I think we would probably have, you know, a number of meetings a week with, with the brand team. And we're really definitely like, I think locked at the arm. It feels as though it's just an extension of how both teams work to, to include, um, to, for us to be included and for us to, to include them. So it's very, symbiotic that way. Um, and 
the, the way that we discuss the, the difference between, I think, UX and brand is that brand is setting those guidelines or that style guide at the enterprise level. We're then adapting it to product UX um, applications. So, and that seems to have worked really well so far as well. So do you have any tips for making sure a brand is educated to some of these challenges? So I think it's it's goes back to sort of the the empathy and curiosity we were talking about earlier that you know meeting with them frequently even if you don't have an agenda or something specific to talk about just so you can understand what is it what are they concerned with what are their issues and through some of that conversation they'll get at like what are you concerned with and what are your issues and you know they're nobody's born knowing how to do any of this stuff on either side and so um, working with them to understand some of those product um, constraints and needs that we have, just like we're understanding some of their um, marketing constraints and needs that they have um, helps us both as creative professionals on both sides of the house, better solve each other's problems. Reporting structure is almost irrelevant. It's really about relationships and, um, you know, rolling up your sleeves and working with your stakeholders and partners to help them solve their problems and they help you solve your problems. That's probably true of all the departments that design needs to work with. Um, I think the, the times I've seen, the, the, what ultimately we're all in service of our customer, right? So ultimately creating great compelling experiences for the customer and that general output seems to come most effectively when the team that are working on it are all empathetic to each other and all reaching out to each other. Um, now, one of the things that changes that product experience and design is way more important than it ever was in the beginning of our careers. And as you look at the trajectory of, of design over the last 10 years, how have you effectively, I won't say argued, but encouraged uh, the broader executive teams to fund design and design resources? So the um, resourcing is always one of those contentious topics. Um, but I think just like everything else in design, which ultimately comes down to what's the problem you're trying to solve and you know, being really clear about that and then going to solve it, you know, we approach resourcing from the standpoint of not strict people and, and sort of butts and seats, but more what are the skills we need to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. And I think the other part too, I'm a big fan of showing, not telling. I think sometimes, you know, in my career, I think I have worked with other design leaders where, where we were just so focused on evangelizing the importance of design. And then that becomes what you're about. And people mm -hmm. like don't even want to talk to you anymore because they know that's what you're going to be showing up and just speaking at them. Um, so, so really focusing on a, a, you know, a few key areas and being methodical and like hiring awesome talent, delivering great work and demonstrating what design can do. And, and that almost then generates demand. And, and I feel like that has been our trajectory here, right, Jason, where if anything yeah. now we, we in some cases have, I think more demand and, and sort of like more resources being offered to us than we can keep up with in terms of hiring to your point earlier, Ron. Uh, but I think it's really been by doing and demonstrating great work um, rather than going around and trying to evangelize and convince everyone about the importance of, of funding design. Yeah, when people see the good work, their next natural question is, how do we get more of that? <laughs> so proving design's value, how do you shift from aesthetic, where people just appreciate that it's beautiful, to actual business results? And do you use specific metrics to prove that what you've done has made an impact to the business? funny I feel like and, and I'll be curious to hear Jason's thought on this that at PayPal we almost had the opposite trajectory hmm. I think we first actually proved that design could help deliver on business goals and then we had to go prove that aesthetics also matter and that we needed to make sure that we built in space in our roadmaps to also create you know beautiful experiences in addition to high performing customer efficient experiences. So that has been more of our journey here. It's your question just made me realize that I had never stopped to think about it. I think 
the two are so interrelated. You know, the ultimately how it works is what really matters, but how it works, like how it looks and how it moves and the interaction patterns, that's all how it works. And so um, things have to be functional and that functionality has to be um, beautiful and interesting and easy and simple and all of those other kind of more fuzzy words um, in order to create those good experiences that are gonna get a customer through that experience the first time. And more importantly, getting them to come back to use it again and again and again. And at the end of the day, I, I still encounter the, the CFO mindset executive, whether it be a CEO, a CPO, uh, or a, many times a CFO when you're asking for more design resources. Are there places where you felt effectively you'd be able to say, this is where we've contributed to the business with this uh, ROI on the, on the resources we fired? A hundred percent. The... Um... You know, there's, I could point to very specific areas in our experience, um, but talking more generically, the, we spend a lot of time up front talking about the metrics and the, how do we know this, how, we, how do we know this is going to be successful? Like, what are we looking at? Um, and yeah, those, those metrics do, I mean, ultimately are all numbers about uh, whatever, but they, they tie into like, what is the customer experience? And especially when you look beyond that initial transaction or that initial first time and you start looking over a period of time, a longer period, um, you can start getting into uh, much more experience focused uh, metrics. And so for experience metrics, are you using NPS or CSAT or others? We have some, um, we don't have anything holistic, like a one single metric, we are starting to implement that in product. We do have NPS and customer support. So talking more about product experience metrics. So we're looking at, at a few of those metrics and starting to, to capture customer satisfaction. We do UX benchmarking as well on our core flows. Um, and then we're just starting to have conversations around sort of like customer benefit measurements, which I think is right even like that level up and even more interesting than than some of I mean all of the metrics are important but I think customer benefit when you when you start having those kinds of conversations I, I think it's a really good evidence that the customer experience matters and, and that it's at the center of, of the types of conversations we're having at PayPal all right this is great so let's tie it all together which is how do you take an organization and move from this screen to this set of screens to this flow to actually an entire customer experience journey? First thing is just what we talked about as well, you know, earlier on, which is just the empathy and really, really understanding your customers. Um, teams that have that customer in mind and that have those pain points in mind, I think will go a lot further in, in really thinking about the overall experience and not just thinking about, you know, at that screen level. So I think that that's number one. And when we've done these kinds of things at disseminated clips, right, you then end up with those situations where you have groups of people coming together and say, wow, this is unacceptable. We need to go fix it. And they might, you know, they come up with extraordinary solutions for that because they're really thinking about that specific customer or that group of customers that, that they may have met with or seen videos of. Um, so I think putting the customer at the center of everything and doing customer journeys to your point, understanding those personas and looking at everything through that lens is how you how you make that evolution from screen level to customer experience level. Right. I think helping designers realize that even though we spend most of our time focused on what's happening on that screen, the customer spends the least amount of their time. You know, focusing on what's happening on that screen. Wonderful. Any parting last tips as, as we wrap? Um, you know, I think this is such an exciting time for design. You know, I think we all talk about how it's the golden age of television because there's such wonderful things out there. I would argue it's the golden age of design right now too. And the amount of focus on it from all of the companies and <clears throat> across the world um, is incredible. There's never been a better time 
to, to be in this profession and have a chance to impact billions of, of customers and, and people's lives. It's, we are in a golden age of design. Couldn't have said it better. I think it's, it's a great, we, we were so lucky. And I think to be in product or design, any of these, these disciplines, I think is just so core to, to everything. And customers have come to expect right a certain level of experience. So I think companies that don't prioritize user experience will have a really hard time competing um, in, in this market. So, well, what a great session. I really enjoyed learning from you and uh, Daniela and Jason. Thank you so much for your time today. Have a wonderful day.